Hey, welcome. What can I get for you? Uh, how many kids do you have? Oh, that's so good to hear. The population of London, Ontario, is oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to be a Great to uh, be here. It's a real honor to, to be with this amazing community, uh, all the communities I know that are, that are watching online and other locations. Uh, I'm so excited to share my story today as a part of this series uh, and to share what God's done in my life uh, over the last 12 or 13 years. So I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia. I was born in a middle-class family. Uh, here's a picture of mom and dad. He was an engineer... Uh, businessman, my mom was a writer. And when I was four, we moved from Philly to the suburbs to get closer to my dad's new job. Now, this was our house that we moved into. Not much to look at. Inside this house, unbeknownst to us at the time, the gas company had installed a furnace that leaked carbon monoxide. Now, this is 15 years before the carbon monoxide detector had been invented, as we know of it. So, Toxic, invisible fumes are filling this house as we're all sleeping. My mom bore the brunt of it because she was fixing up the basement during the day. And on New Year's Day, she walks across my parents' bedroom and she collapses unconscious on the floor. We take her to the hospital, uh, and after a long series of blood tests, they find these massive amounts of carboxyhemoglobin, of carbon monoxide, in her bloodstream. Now, mom is never the same again. She didn't die, thankfully, but her immune system irreparably died that day. So I watched my mom as, this four, as a four-year-old boy go from this healthy super mom. She couldn't do anything wrong. She was amazing. I watched her go from this to an invalid overnight, allergic to the world. From this point on, anything chemical made her sick, whether it was car fumes, whether it was perfume or cologne. The ink from books would make her sick. I remember from this point on, uh, because she was a journalist and wanted to read, my dad and I would bake her books in the oven to try to get the smell of the print out. And then I would take sometimes these slightly charred books up to the room which she lived. It was kind of a containment cell, a tile bathroom that had been scrubbed down with special soap uh, covered in aluminum foil. And if she wore this charcoal mask and if she had gloves on her hand, she could put the book in a cellophane bag and read it. And my parents had a, a deep Christian faith. They decided not to sue the gas company for gross negligence. My dad actually ripped out the heater and found the cracks himself. They believed that God would provide for the needs of our family, and they didn't want to become bitter. So I grew up as an only child in a caregiver role, doing the cooking, doing the cleaning, taking care of mom, playing piano in church. Later, I, I joined the worship band. And I was that good Christian kid that didn't smoke, didn't have sex, didn't you know, uh, swear, uh, I didn't drink, I didn't try drugs. I played by the rules for 18 years. <laughs> and then at 18, you know, I had one of these moments. Now it's my turn. Time to look out for number one. All these rules, you know, I, I'm missing out on the fun. So I joined a band. I grew my hair down to my shoulders, which was a terrible idea. I moved to New York City in search of Rock and roll fame. This lasted about a month. Our band immediately broke up because we hated each other. <laughs> but I learned that if you were seeking rebellion, there was a way to do it in style. And there was actually a job called a nightclub promoter where you could get paid to drink alcohol for free. If you could get the right people inside the right nightclubs, you could charge them astronomical amounts for liquor. People would pay $20 for a cocktail. They'd spend $500 on a bottle of champagne that cost 40 
So for the next 10 years, I climbed up New York City's social you know, nightlife ladder. I was the guy behind the velvet rope and the one-way glass deciding who got in and who got out. Here's a picture of my life exactly 10 years later. I'm in a VIP room, and what is so sad about this photo is that the thing I think is important in this moment is pretentiously craning my wrist so that some club photographer I've never met notices I'm wearing a Rolex. This is somewhere around midnight. If you would have met me five or six hours later at some disgusting after hours, it was a much less pretty story. Go to dinner at 10, the club at 12, after hours at five, often to bed at 12 or one the next day. And as you can imagine, a decade in nightlife, I'd picked up every vice that would come with the territory, short of heroin. Smoked two packs of cigarettes for 10 years. I had a gambling problem, a pornography problem, a strip club problem, a cocaine, an ecstasy, marijuana problem. And I'd come so far from the spirituality, the morality, my heritage, my poor parents. Can you imagine for these 10 years? They had little old ladies at their church, you know, down on their knees wearing holes in the carpets for their prodigal son. 10 years later, I'm in Punta del Esta. I'm in South America, this big party town. And my friends and I had rented a house with servants and horses. And we'd bought $1,000 of fireworks, magnums of Dom Perignon. This was the good life. I had gotten almost everything I'd been looking for. I had a grand piano in my New York apartment. I drove a BMW. I had a Rolex. My girlfriend was on the cover of magazines. I had a Labrador retriever. What more could one want? <laughs> and I realized on this trip that I had become the worst person I knew. There was no one more bankrupt in every sense of the word, spiritually, emotionally, morally, than I. And if I continued down this path, the legacy that I was leaving was... Not one at all, really. My tombstone would have read, here lies a man who's gotten a million people wasted over the course of his life. Bravo. My father had sent some dense theology down with me on this trip. I mean, he had been trying for 10 years, everything that worked. Signed me up for Models for Christ once email list, <laughs> thinking that would work. I'm hungover during the days, but something just happened on this trip, and I started reading A.W. Tozer. I started reading the Bible again, I think I was confronted with the exact opposite of my life, a, a life of virtue and purity and, and a search for values and righteousness and uh, service to others. I determined leaving that trip to make a radical change in my life. I came back to New York and began asking the question, what would the exact opposite look like? Instead of hedonistic, sycophant uh, service to myself, what would it look like to help others? So it took me a few months of turmoil, and about six months later, I just, I made the move. I sold almost everything I owned. I remember putting up 2,000 DVDs on eBay in one single lot trying to purge, back when they were worth something. And I began to apply to the famous humanitarian organizations I'd heard of, the Oxfams and World Visions and Samaritan Purse and the, the UNICEFs of the world. I was ready to do one year of service for the, the 10 years that I'd selfishly wasted, kind of a tithe. So I put in all these applications, I've left New York, I've given up my apartment, and as you can imagine, I'm denied by every single organization I've applied to. No one will touch me with a 10-foot pole. You know, these are serious humanitarians saving the world. I'm getting 1,000 people drunk every night. How could I in any way be useful to their mission? Finally, one organization said that if I was willing to pay them $500 a month and go live in a country I'd never heard of called Liberia, then I could join their humanitarian mission. I said, this is perfect. This is really the opposite. I'd never heard of this country. I have to pay? <laughs> so a couple months later, I'm sailing into West Africa, joining this extraordinary organization called Mercy Ships. Now, we'd flown in with 14,000 United Nations peacekeeping troops. I'll tell you about the country in the moment, but this organization, Mercy Ships, many of you have heard of them. For 25 years, they sailed a 500-foot hospital ship up and down the coast of Africa, bringing the best doctors and surgeons to people who couldn't afford access to medical care. 
Amazing organization. So I was going to be their volunteer photojournalist. I put some pictures of girlfriends and my dog on a blog, and I dusted off an NYU degree that I'd never used in communication and said, look, I'm going to be able to tell stories. I actually have a lot of people on my list. So let me be your photojournalist. So I have this moment before I walk up the gangway of that ship where I felt like I had to quit it all. I felt like I had to go all in. So I put on a pack of Nicorette, uh, or the, the patch, I had Nicorette gum, I had gone out with a bang, I think I'd had six or eight beers the night before, but I just kind of knew that this was it. I had to literally sail away from my vices and leave them, if I wanted to start a new story, if I wanted to step into what God might have for me, it would require radical obedience. So I never smoked again, I never gambled again, I never set foot in a strip club, I never looked at pornography again. I was celibate for five and a half years until my wedding night. And I just believed that if I gave this all up, maybe something amazing would happen. So Liberia was a complete disaster. You guys have heard of Charles Taylor, I'm sure, in the 14-year Civil War. He used child soldiers to destroy this country, and people were living in bombed-out apartment buildings that looked like this, in houses that were actually once beautiful but had been decimated by the war. When we went into Liberia, there was one doctor for every 50,000 citizens. Here, I think the ratio is 1 to 180 of us. Before the ship hit the port, a small advance team would post these flyers throughout the country, and we were looking for people with giant facial tumors, flesh-eating disease, something I'd never heard of, people born with cleft lips and cleft palates, people who'd been burned during the war, sometimes by rebels who'd poured oil on them or their children. And I wondered, would anyone turn up? I knew that we had 1,500 available surgery slots. And my third day on the mission, I grabbed my cameras, put on hospital scrubs, jumped into a Land Rover convoy at 5 a.m., and we started heading in the darkness towards the football stadium, the soccer arena that the government had given us to see the patients. We turned the corner, and there are more than 5,000 people standing outside the stadium doors. And it hit me. We're going to turn thousands of these people away who have come with hope. Many of them, we learned, have walked for more than a month from neighboring countries with their children just in the hope of seeing a doctor. First child in line was this little boy named Alfred. He was 14 years old, and he was suffocating to death on his own face with a benign tumor. His mother had brought him there a few days earlier, wanting to make sure he got seen. And through a translator, she pulls out this photo and says, four years ago, my son was fine. But then this tumor began to grow and there was no one to take him to. And now my son is on the brink of death. He's unable to eat properly. So I realized that we were there to help people like Alfred. And a couple days later, I scrubbed up and got to document his surgery as these amazing volunteer surgeons removed his tumor. They threw it in the bin. And then a week later, I said, I'd like to take him home and see what it's like when someone who's been written off for dead is, is brought back into community. And I watched as hundreds of people greeted Alfred, and I got to watch him heal. And this is what our life was like every day. I would wake up in the morning, I would go down on the ward, I would meet the patients that were scheduled for the day. Marceline, this woman, told me that this tumor had grown for almost 10 years, and that people would stone her when they saw her face, because they thought she was spiritually cursed. They would throw rocks at her, so she had to cover her face with this towel. She needed a 40-minute surgery just to remove a benign mass. That year changed my life. I took more than 50,000 photographs, and every few days I was blasting my club list of the 15,000 people I had been getting drunk with these photos. As you can imagine, that list got a little smaller. <laughs> people were like, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. I signed up for the Prada party, not the leprosy party. But people began to give money. They began to be moved. They began to start volunteering. And I learned that images and stories had the power to move people to greater compassion, to greater empathy, towards action. I signed up for a second tour. And on that second tour, I got off the ship. And I started traveling around in the rural areas and even to other countries. And I saw dirty water for the first time. 
I had never seen a human being drink dirty water in my life. Water for me cost $10. It was called Voss. We would sell it in clubs to people who wouldn't even open it. And as I traveled around, I saw human beings drinking from ponds and from rivers, sources that I wouldn't let my dog walk in. I met this girl, Hawa, 13-year-old girl, realized for the the entirety of her life, she had never known any other water to drink, to bathe, to cook with than this pond. So I'm back and forth with the villages and I'm in surgery and I'm telling the doctors what I'm seeing and they're like, yeah, we know. So much disease in the world is caused by bad water. Why don't you go work on that issue? So I started traveling around learning about this. I learned that 663 million people Right now, one-tenth of the world is going to drink, they're all going to drink bad water today simply because of the conditions they've been born into. By no choice of their own, any more than we got to choose where we were born, a tenth of the planet is risking their lives every day with unsafe water. Now, we look at statistics like this and our minds just kind of go numb. Can't imagine 663 million anything, let alone people without water. But in that are just people with names and hopes and dreams and kids like John Bosco in southern Rwanda. This is his water. This is the only water he knew his entire life. Imagine letting your child or your friend or your brother or sister walk into water like that. Put it on your face to drink with it. Or a girl like this in Honduras drinking water from a river that looks more like chocolate milk. As you can imagine, there are a lot of diseases associated with bad water. Many you have heard of in this room. You've all heard of cholera. You've all heard of E. coli. Maybe you haven't heard of schistosomiasis. It's a fancy word for worms. Parasites. A couple hundred million people have worms crawling around in their body because of the water they've had to drink. The World Health Organization says that 52% of all disease throughout the developing world is caused by bad water and a lack of toilets. Half the people that are sick in these countries don't need to be sick. They just have this basic need met. This child was drinking from the Molo River in northern Kenya, and every time she would drink from this bottle, she would vomit on her shirt. I remember watching in horror with a few friends, and we took the water away from her. We promised to try to find a a solution for her village. But I wanted to know what was actually in the water, and I took this bottle back to New York, and I gave it to friends at a lab, and I said, would you put this under a microscope? They sent me this video of that water. And I remember, you know, in their estimation, they said, look, we're not experts in all the different kinds of amoebas and parasites, but you sent us water that is alive. No one should be drinking water like this. Leeches are a huge problem. We would travel to communities and the women would would pull the leeches out of the water and say, look, this is a big problem for us. We we always can seem to pull the big ones out, but sometimes these little leeches will get through the cloth that we're pouring the water through, through our scarves, through our t-shirts. And they grow up inside our bodies and they grow up inside our children's bodies and they crawl up and stick to the back of the throat. And if you're a parent and you're dealing with this, you have two options. One is to take a stick and to try to pry the leech. But if you don't kill it, it just crawls up again. And the second is to give your child a little bit of diesel fuel, just enough to scald the leech, and hopefully not enough to injure your child. I learned of the huge impact and the link between water and education. I learned that half of the world's schools didn't have clean water or toilets. Now, toilets were a huge problem. If you're a teenage girl, You drop out of school. You wind up staying home four, five, six days every single month because there's no toilet at your school. You fall behind in your studies and then you do this for the rest of your childhood days. Carry 40 pounds of dirty water on your back in the hot sun. It's a women's issue. Unfortunately, I've been to 66 countries now. I have never been in a place where it was the men that were getting the water. And we see women in the most undignified situations. Women digging in the sand like this woman in Kenya. 
I remember asking her, because she hadn't gotten any water in there, I don't see many other women in this riverbed. Where are they going? She said, well, there's another source. It's a big flowing river. But the problem there is that we get attacked by crocodiles. You know, the first couple times you hear things like this, you say, oh, it can't be true. You hear it 30 times, 50 times, 80 times. This was that river. Imagine stepping in in fear. And then this is the quality of the water that you, as a mom, are bringing home to your family, to your children. The good news is, and this is what I have loved about working on this issue, it is a completely solvable problem. There is not a single person on earth that needs to drink dirty water right now. It's not like some of these you know, diseases that we're looking for cures in test tubes, maybe decades in the future. We know how to give clean water to every human being right now. We don't have the will to do it. We haven't allocated the resources, but a lot of different things work in a lot of different contexts. Sometimes you can dig wells. Sometimes you can build rainwater harvesting systems. Sometimes biosand filters. It's often as simple as $10,000 to drill a well. And the terrible irony is that so many of these communities are living on top of the resource that could save their lives and improve their health. But they don't have access to a million dollars of drilling rigs and compressors and trucks. They don't have access to local hydrologists skilled at finding the water and protecting it. But when you strike water in one of these communities, it is one of the most amazing things. It, is, it never gets old. Being there in that moment, if there's anything more that's a picture of heaven than this, I don't know what it is. The kids rush the drilling rig, clapping, sla- dancing, smiling. I'll play just a short clip. Put yourself in the moment. Imagine seeing clean water for the very first time in your life, as in this village in Malawi. We've said for years, water changes everything. It is one of the most powerful transformative agents on earth. Water touches so many things, things we don't even think about. It impacts health. If your kids are drinking clean water and not water with leeches or parasites in it, obviously they're healthier. If kids have clean water at their schools, you get better students. Women. They're not walking five, six, seven hours every single day, get time back. They use that time to provide for their families, often selling rice at the market or peanuts, earning an income. I was just in Zambia and Zimbabwe with women who were selling rugs for $4 that they were making. Some women tell us they're just better moms because they spend more time with their children, less time walking. What I think I most loved about working on this issue was it was one of the very few things on earth that every single person could agree on. We fight about everything these days. We fight about religion. We fight about politics. We fight about geography and borders. But I thought this is something that everybody could agree on. Nobody wants children to drink water that puts their lives at risk. Whether you're a Jew or a Christian or an atheist or a Muslim or a Republican or independent or Democratic, people could agree on clean water for others. But yet 660 million people live without. I came back after my time with Mercy Ships to New York City and I was completely broke. I had given all my money to them and the people that I'd met along the way and nightclub promoters are not good at saving money. But I started Charity Water. I wanted to see if I could make an impact in this huge, insurmountable issue. Now, I was living in a little loft. An old club friend had taken me in. I was actually sleeping on the closet floor next to this room. And he said, you can use my couch as your first office. And I was running around telling everybody that I wanted to see an end to the water crisis. I wanted to see a day on earth when everyone had clean water, regardless of where they were born. But as I started talking to my friends, I realized this was not going to be easy. 
because my friends were not giving to charity. They were cynical. They were skeptical. I realized that people didn't trust charities. Now, I found the data behind this. It turns out 42% of Americans distrust charities, and 70% of Americans think charities waste money. So I thought if we're going to make a dent in a problem this big, we need to do something very different. We need a new way to approach this, to reach some of these disenchanted people who should be giving and bring them back to the table. I love the idea of charity. It was to serve others in need. Charity was a virtue. We needed more of that in the world. Charity means love. It's caritas in the Latin. So I had a couple big ideas. We would reinvent charity. That's what we would really do underneath it all. First, we had a problem, a deal with the money. The problems people have with the money. How much of my money is actually going to go reach these people? I said, what if we created a way where 100% of every donation we would ever take in the history of the organization would go straight to the projects? And people were like, well, that's the dumbest idea. You clearly didn't get a business degree. How will you pay for your staff, your overhead? I'm like, I don't know, faith. <laughs> opened up two bank accounts and said, we'll never touch the public's money, 100% will go to projects, and somehow I will personally raise money on the other side from a small group of people who can catch the vision of those unsung costs. The second thing is we would prove where all those dollars went. We would build an organization that was hyper-transparent from day one. We would put all of our water projects up on Google Earth and Google Maps so anybody from the public could go and see where they were. Third thing we would do is we would work with local partners. I just believe that for work to be sustainable, it must be led by the locals in these countries. Not by Westerners like me. I had no business drilling a well in Bangladesh or India or Malawi. I could help raise awareness and get people to care and raise resources, but the work must be led by the locals to be sustainable. Believe it or not, this is so different than the way people were doing things that it just began to grow. Started with a birthday party. Now, I, it feels so uncreative now, but the only idea I had was to throw a party in a nightclub <laughs> on my birthday. So I got all my friends to come. I lured them there with open bar. 700 people came. And I said, just throw 20 bucks in on the way in. And this time, instead of putting the $15,000 in my pocket, we took every single penny to a refugee camp in northern Uganda where we did our first few projects. And then we sent the photos and the GPS back to those 700 people that attended the party. And they couldn't believe something had actually happened. People were drinking clean water because they'd thrown 20 bucks in a bin. And we said, let's just keep doing this on repeat. Keep showing people the impact of their donations and maybe this thing can continue to grow. We try to get people to think differently about the issue. Imagine giving your kid death in a baby bottle getting donated media on buses and on taxi tops. We built a digital-only business. We never direct mailed. We just didn't know anyone that was responding to that stuff. We thought the movements of the future would be built online, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. And we are always looking for ways to celebrate our community, the amazing things our community, our diverse community, was doing to raise awareness and money for others in need. We partnered creatively with brands, even luxury brands. We went to Saks Fifth Avenue and said, you guys have figured out how to sell women $5,000 handbags. That is amazing. We have some $5,000 water projects, and we're both had our headquartered in New York. We should totally be working together. <laughs> I, I think this is the craziest thing they'd ever heard, so they did not throw me out of the CEO's office, and they wound up giving us the windows on Fifth Avenue for a week after Mr. Armani took his down, and the windows in Beverly Hills in Chicago and they got their employees involved and their customers involved and their vendors involved and they raised over $700,000 to bring clean water to over 100 communities. American Express came to us and said, we'd like to talk to our customers about what you're doing and see if we can raise awareness. They put us on their homepage for three months. They took out a huge print campaign raising awareness of the water crisis. Things just started to go really right. People were responding to this new business model. We got invited to open up the NASDAQ. Now, we're a nonprofit. But when companies wouldn't be able to get it together at the last minute, they would call us and try and give us this awareness. Same thing with the New York Stock Exchange. We've done this collectively five or six times now. 
In this amazing moment early on, a few years in, things had been growing, and I was invited down to the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C., and I don't spend time in D.C. I don't really have a network there. Someone had invited my wife and I, and I'm sitting there, the very back of the room, and President Obama starts making his remarks. I'll just play them for you. Back home, your churches, your temples, synagogues, your fellow congregants, so many faith groups across this great country of ours. I, I came upon a group recently uh, called uh, Charity Water, uh, a group that supports clean water projects overseas. Uh, th this is a, a project that was started by a former nightclub promoter named Scott Harrison, who grew weary of living only for himself and feeling like he wasn't following Christ as well as he should. And because of Scott's good work, Charity Water has helped 1.7 million people get access to clean water. And in the next 10 years, he plans to make clean water accessible to 100 million more. That's the kind of promoting we need more of. And that's the kind of faith that moves mountains. And there's stories like that scattered across this room of people taking it upon themselves to make a difference. So the organization began to, to grow and grow, and then we stumbled on this idea, a very, very simple idea, but we said, what if we could do more with the, the birthday? What if we could get people to give up their birthday, to donate their birthday in the service of others? Now, birthdays have become about us. It's a time to celebrate ourselves. We get gifts, we throw ourselves parties. So what if we could turn them into generous moments about others? So I got the idea to have people ask for their age in dollars. I thought that would be a sticky idea. I was turning 32. Everyone I knew had $32 they could donate if 100% of the money went and they could see the photos and GPS of those projects. So I raised a bunch of money with mine. Then this seven-year-old kid in Austin, Texas starts knocking on doors asking for $7 donations. I'm not going to lie. He lived in a nice neighborhood. <laughs> raised $22,000. <laughs> so this idea starts to take off. Tony Hawk donates his birthday. Jack Dorsey, who created Twitter and Square, gives up three birthdays, raises almost $200,000. Will and Jada Smith donate their birthdays. Then they ask their fans to spread the idea. They actually came with us to Ethiopia to see the impact that their birthday had made. All that was cool, but what we were fired up about was six-year-old kids that were not famous, 16-year-olds like Maggie Moran, one of my favorite, 89-year-old Nona Ween. If you look at her mission statement, it's quite beautiful. She says, I'm turning 89, and I'd like to make that possible for more people. She's lived double the life expectancy in so many of these places where we work because of the privilege she was born into. And if her birthday could help other people have more birthdays, live healthier lives, then she didn't want anything. People said, I gotta do something right now. My birthday is 10 months from now. People started climbing mountains, trying to raise a dollar a foot. We've had skydivers for charity water. We've had people make sales and sail the Atlantic. We've had uh, people take the $10,000 like Sid that he saved up for an engagement ring and buy a water project in India and say, I wanna start our marriage with an act of radical generosity instead of a ring. <laughs> Jesse's here in Atlanta. Listen to Nickelback. For 168 consecutive hours, <laughs> was rewarded for his pain, $38,000, <laughs> A lot of kids, five-year-old kids, painting for charity water. Uh, Riley ate rice and beans for a month. This is actually quite a profound photo. Her mom sent this to us and said, Riley went on your website and saw that 4,000 kids die every day of bad water. Riley asked her mom for paper and pen, and she begins to write down 4,000 lines because she wanted to know how big the number was and feel it. Maddie in Vancouver has done 12 lemonade stands. At her 12th lemonade stand, she convinced a local band to perform next to her stand to attract <laughs> lemonade buyers. She's now over $5,000 in sales. This amazing community of people bringing the best of themselves, their talents, their uh, ideas, their inspiration, begins to spring up their birthdays. Rachel, this incredible story from Seattle. I'd spoken at her church, and I'd asked everyone at the end to donate their birthday. 
And Rachel was about to turn nine, so she gives up her birthday, and she only raises $220. Her goal was $300. Tells her mom, I'm going to try harder next year. She actually felt like she'd let people down. And right after her birthday, she's killed in a 20-car pileup. The only fatality. Word spreads of Rachel's last wish, which was for people she'd never met across an ocean, to get clean water instead of gifts or a party. And people begin to donate $9. It spreads through Seattle, spreads across the country, spreads across Europe. People in Africa start donating $9. Over 37,000 strangers come together and give $1.2 million in her honor. Didn't stop there. So many of those 37,000 people donated their birthdays. They raised another $2 million. Rachel helped over 100,000 people get clean water from $220. The purity of her heart inspired so many others. We realized the charity water wasn't our story. It certainly wasn't my story. It was so much bigger than that. It was the story of Maddie and Nona and Max And Rachel, it was the story of John Bosco. It was the story of our local partners working 29 out of 30 days to drill in Ethiopia, taking one day off a month because they wanted to maximize the eight-month dry season and help as many people as possible. And if we could continue to tell this is the story of others and continue to invite people in and get out of the way, maybe this thing would continue to grow. In 10 years now, more than 1 million people have made this a part of their story. And they've generously contributed over a quarter of a billion dollars. Funding projects for now 7.1 million people. 7.1 million people across 24 countries currently employing over 1,500 locals who get up every day with the resources to lead their communities forward with integrity and with passion. As we look ahead, this is the beginning of our next decade in year 11. And we realize 7 million people, okay, it's a lot. It's a lot of people. It's a thousand times the space, the capacity of the Georgia Dome. But it's 1% of the need. And this gets me on about 90 flights a year. This gets our team out there passionately advocating on behalf of the poor because we believe in a world where everyone has clean water to drink and we wanna go faster, we wanna help more people. If you're sitting here wondering how you can help, there are three main ways. The first is you can pray for us, you can partner and pray for our work. We are believers in miracles. I have seen so many miracles over the last 10 years. We had a moment early on where we'd raise millions of dollars in the water bank account, but we were about to miss our payroll in the other bank account. People were praying, Complete stranger walked in off the street, wrote a million dollar check. We've had miracles of office. Many, many answers to prayer over the last decade. Would you remember us in your prayers? The second would be to donate your next birthday. I can promise you no one wants to get you more stuff. If someone's gonna organize a big party, you can save them a lot of time and expense. Consider using your birthday in the service of others. Consider inviting your friends and your family into this. The amazing thing about this is the average person involves 15 people in their inner circle and raises over $1,000 helping 30 people get clean water through their birthday. The third and final way is something that's brand new for us that, that we did to mark year 11. And it's a new community we're growing called The Spring. We've had a million people give once, and that's amazing, but we said, what if we could get a build, uh, grow a community of people who would show up for us month in and month out, giving just a little, giving what they could every month. A subscription for good. Now, we subscribe to a lot of things these days. The average person in this room would have 11 subscriptions. Spotify, Apple Music, Netflix, Hulu, HBO, Cinemax, magazines, newspapers, Dropbox. We are used to this. We get benefit from all of these. All these subscriptions benefit us or we turn them off. So what if we could create a community that benefited others, where 100% of the subscription, the benefit was passed on to others around the world. And we could show people what was happening month in and month out. Cost us $30 to give one person clean water. Some people could do that every month, some people could do more. 
People started to join from 80 countries. And if it's something you'd like to learn more about, it's probably the most important way people can partner with us going forward. We set up a link um, just for this community to be able to track the impact. This is an incredibly generous community. I know you guys support many, many things. You can go to charitywater.org slash Atlanta to learn more. What I'm sure of is in the kingdom of God, no one is drinking dirty water. No one is walking five hours. No women are giving their children water with leeches in it. I told you about John Bosco earlier. His story is as clear a picture of what happens when everyday people reach out their arms across an ocean, when they reject the apathy that is so easy to succumb to when you hear a number like 663 million people. What could we ever do? Well, a million people said a little something. John Bosco went from drinking this water with his entire family, water we wouldn't let our dogs drink, water is just so unthinkable to us. And then because everyday people heard about his story and cared and reached out across an ocean, drilling rigs started rolling towards his village. And he got to watch local Rwandans jump out, heroes to him, and look for clean water underneath the village. They found it a couple days later, they started building the well, and by the end of that week, he was drinking clean water for the very first time in his life. We've been back to see him over the years, and this story is now eight years old. And when we first met him, he was very much a boy. And now he's a man. And he's gotten married, and he has a beautiful daughter named Jean-Marie. And we realize his daughter will never have to drink from that swamp. The cycle has been broken in this village. And that's worth doing. That's what gets us up each and every day to continue fighting for little girls like Jean-Marie, for fathers and mothers like John Bosco and his wife. I'll leave you with two final thoughts. The first, maybe there are people in this room that are haunted or hounded by your past. Maybe you've done awful things, worse than me maybe, although I don't know that that's possible. Let me just tell you something that I am sure of, something that I have learned. God can absolutely redeem anything and anyone, and it's one of the things he has so much fun doing. I'm, I'm walking proof of that. If you had met me 14 years ago, you would have met this guy filled with rage and anger, spewing obscenity. You would not have invited me to speak at your church. <laughs> Stepping out in, in faith and obedience, God's blessed me with an amazing, amazing life's work, a beautiful wife an incredible family, a three-year-old boy uh, named Jackson who is already driving, as you can see, <laughs> our one-year-old daughter named Emma. My life is unrecognizable from those days of the clubs, from those days of running away from God. I love this verse in Joel. It says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. And then there's a locusts and worms and just you get this idea of a desolate, barren, clear-cut area. There is nothing left. There is no hope that a crop would ever grow there again. God says, you will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God because he has worked wonders for you. It's true in my life. I'm sure it's true in many of your lives. I'll leave you with my favorite quote. Guy, 10 years ago, was walking by a bodega, sent me a picture, and it was this. Do not be afraid of work that has no end. It's from an ancient Jewish text. I love this. Do not be afraid of work that has no end. If your work is in the service of others, if your work is intentional, ending the suffering, the needless suffering in the world, it will have no end. That's okay. You see, when we see an end of the water crisis, we're not just going to drop the mic and go get rich. We're going to go and turn our skills, our community on another area of need. Maybe it would be shelter. Maybe it would be health. Maybe it would be hunger. Do not be afraid of work that has no end. And I would ask you to ask yourself, for me, it's water. Maybe for some of you too, this resonates. Maybe for others, it's, it's slavery. It's justice issues. It's hunger. It's 
any of the things that you see in the world that you say, not on my watch. It's just not okay. I encourage you, use your time, your talent, your resources. You will not regret it. I hope some of you might join us. I'd like to end in prayer. God, thanks for this unbelievable community. This is a community of people who care about others. It's a generous community for all the people watching, Lord, that you would stir up in their hearts compassion and generosity, that you would show them they are greater than their past. You would show them the things that you want to do in and through them, through their time, through their talents, through their resources. God, we thank you that you like to restore things, that you care about the poor living around the world. And we pray that you would continue to use us. In Jesus' name, amen.